what's the jazz tour like like you know in where where do you go what do you do sure okay so it's important to understand that when we started the jazz safari in 2005 we started it because we couldn't there were no live venues if we wanted to go and catch some great live music well we couldn't the music that was available was cover versions it was not interesting it was very frustrating and i knew the musicians i worked with them we'd done records together and so I thought, well, maybe there's a way that we can invert the model and take people into the homes of the musicians, let them stay where they are. And let's take small audiences to them. And so we started to experiment with that. And it, it, I mean, of course, it's the bomb. You, you take you go into somebody's home, they play a concert for you in their lounge and they feed you their own home cooked, delicious you know, food. There's so much value. There's so much magic in that. But the industry initially said, you are out of your mind. You're taking people at nighttime into musicians' homes, that's a lot of variables. And we said, yeah, sure, that's life. Life is full of variables. And the trade was like uneasy and uncertain until we appeared in the New York Times. They, a writer at the New York Times did a feature on the jazz safari. And the next thing, boom, you know, we just got calls from everywhere and suddenly local trade went, wow, there's this music event at nighttime. We really need something at nighttime. Can we book? And so it was, it was this weird thing of, I mean, I didn't come from tourism, I didn't know the language, and I wasn't thinking about how do we integrate with how tourism works. I was just thinking, we need to do this, there's a need, the musicians need cash, we need to make money as entrepreneurs, what is this possible? And that's how it started, and then slowly you learn how to work with the trade and, and how, to, how to use the language and how to present things in ways that make sense and fit into people's itineraries and programs. And so it was kind of these two these two planets are rotating around each other, orbiting around each other and, and learning to talk. And that was the very first experience that we had that became commercially successful. And then from there we could, we could open it up. But once, once we'd opened that door and people could see that this did actually make sense from an experience point of view and was extremely deeply satisfying, then it became a lot easier to sell people some far crazier ideas. But what we do is we take people into the homes of musicians and these homes are spread across the city, it could be Tamborskloof, Woodstock, Guguletu, Paro, it doesn't matter, it's right across the geography of the city, which is great because it gives people very different geographic and as a result, cultural and political access within the city. And you're listening to original music, that's the other important thing. So you're, you're, kind, of, you're kind of being allowed into these spaces that give you this very genuine, very original insight into the place that you're visiting. And it's very intimate. It's not like going to a club where you're there with another hundred people. You're in somebody's home and there's a vulnerability there. And I think that's really the one thing I'd love people to, to think about as this interview ends is that vulnerability in travel is what makes the magic possible. When you can be vulnerable and not everybody can do it. These are not experiences for everybody, you know, but the vulnerability on all sides is what allows for a really special human interaction and people go home and they may have spent a fortune on one of the best safari game safaris imaginable, but what they really hold was this experience of being a human with another human being in a different part of the world. That's the magic.